a relatively new democracy, apparently having um, you know, difficulty. We are at the turning point in history whether democracy is winning or democracy is losing. Hello and welcome to a special talk event on a very important subject, global democracy, its health, its future, and the implications for the Indo-Pacific region. I'm Jonathan Sobel, former Tokyo Bureau Chief at the Financial Times, currently a partner at Crayab Japan, a strategic communications firm here in Tokyo. Today my co-host and commentator is Yuichi Hosoya, professor at Keio University and the head of the Keio Center for Strategy. Before we dive in, can you tell us a little bit about the center? Yes, uh, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, we have established a new think tank within Keio University in March this year, Keio Center for Strategy. And the Keio Center for Strategy is trying to be a hub of researchers at Keio University, business community, as well as government institutions. By combining these talents, we are trying to create discussion, rich discussion within the think tank, both internally and internationally. Great, thank you very much. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce our special guest today. She's Maiko Ichihara. She's a professor at Hitotsubashi University, an expert on foreign policy, human rights, and democracy. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. So we've, we've talked a lot about the government's role, right, mm -hmm. and foreign policy, but of course the private sector is extremely important. Universities, think tanks, companies, NGOs, uh, you know, they can do some things that governments can't in some cases mm -hmm. because, of course, a government, whether it's uh, you know, Japan's or anyone else's, has to get along with lots of different countries which don't always share your values. Mm -hmm. So you might not be able to bring in these values conversations into your, into your diplomacy, but the private sector sometimes can. Right. Isn't that right? Right, yeah. yeah. And that's really crucial because um, you know, democracy, democratic recession, meaning that um, especially the fact that um, it's happening at the time of this um, geostrategic competition is that um, you know, those democratic countries that are, uh, that are working together, for example, to support Ukraine or to um, you know, um, tackle um, environmental issues or um, you know, um, economic security issues or what have you, mm -hmm. um, have to help each other makes it difficult for us to criticize um, mm -hmm. human rights violations or um, repression in um, each, other, each other's countries. So that limits governmental role. And um, this is where um, the civil society um, actors can actually play a role. Yes, right. And also, uh, you know, Professor Jose, of course, the KO Center for Strategy is part of this nexus of you know, right. private sector institutions that are uh, involved in these issues. Uh, you also look at government policy, though. Yeah. Where is the right balance uh, between, for example, uh, practical diplomacy with authoritarian countries that's designed to achieve important goals, like, for example, getting cooperation from China or other actors in climate change, uh, and the need to support democracy, which these countries, you know, aren't always on board with? Well, uh, on these affairs, I always feel that uh, civil society must be empowered and of course uh, think tanks are going to uh, and trying to empower uh, those civil society and uh, I think that the KO Center for Strategy is also trying to empower civil society to know more about what's going on in the world because sometimes it's very difficult to access to some of the materials and the knowledge is uh, about what's going on in the world like in Ukraine or in Russia or in the Middle East as well. So that's why we are gathering experts, uh, of course, that, like Ichihara-san uh, in this program to try to enlighten people to know more about international relations. But and at the same time, I always feel that the Japan has a little bit more robust democracy or stable democracy and than the other countries' democracy for some reasons. And we are immune to some of the influence operations unlike in other countries. Number one, because of the language. Sometimes the Japanese language can be a barrier to those attacks. Because if we are using English, it's much easier for those who try to penetrate into the society. 
And also in Taiwan, they are using Chinese, different kind of Chinese, but for Chinese people in mainland China, it would be easier for them to use their language to try to influence people in Taiwan by exercising their influence operations in Taiwan. So language can be a little bit a barrier uh, for us in Japan to defend our own democracy. And uh, number two, we have relatively strong media, our quality media. Uh, in many liberal democracies, media, uh, traditional media are facing serious problems and uh, less and less people are reading newspapers. But in Japan, uh, huge numbers, maybe 10 times more uh, people are reading demo, uh, newspapers. Of course, these numbers are declining every year, but at the same time, those numbers are still huge. So many people still rely on traditional media in Japan, and uh, they try to have information from those media. As long as those media exist, I think that the people can rely on some of the important information. But of course, these are not enough. Uh, people, are, particularly youngsters, are relying more and more on like YouTube and SNS and so on. And YouTubes and SNS, these actually uh, spaces are much more vulnerable to influence operation. In a sense, we are trying to produce counter-attack to defend rational uh, thinking or rational understanding about international relations or politics by providing many programs or many uh, 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 commentaries to those media, new media like SNS and YouTube. These are what we are now doing. So in the sense, I think we need to provide a reliable information to youngsters as well who are relying on relying on SNS and also uh, YouTubes and so on. So combining these two things, traditional media as well as new media like SNS and YouTubes, if we can provide sufficient amount of reliable, rational information to these media, I think that a Japanese democracy uh, remains strong, I suppose. And what about you, Professor Richard? Do you think Japan has some kind of natural immunity, or is it just, in a sense, on the same trend line as other uh, developed democracies, just a little bit behind because its newspapers have such huge subscriptions? Yes, they're declining. Uh, it's not as noticeable because the, the absolute numbers are still big, but it's going that in that direction. What's your view? Well, um as a person who has been um, conducting research on influence operations, um, I would always um, want to be cautious um, because, um, as I said, um, until something happens, we tend to think that um, you know we are well um, not affected by influence operations. And um, but and yet, um, as um, Jose has said, um, well, one of the um, strength that the Japanese um, society has would be um, the relatively high trust in traditional media. Mm -hmm. And um, that would um, be because of the um, well weaker level of partisanship um, in, well, amongst the media. Well, although we have been seeing um, you know um, somewhat um, greater well increased um, partisan partisanship, and um, and so um, this has been causing people to still get information from traditional media rather than getting um, in, well information from friends and um, you know friends friend um, via SNS and stuff. And also, those countries that are, um, you know, strong subjects of influence operations tend to be the ones where people use SNS for a very long time. For example, in the Philippines, Indonesia, and the, uh, Malaysia, those Southeast Asian countries, well, people's average use of SNS is more than 10 hours a day. And so they, they tend to receive um, a lot of information from uh, via SNS, uh, including uh, a lot of disinformation and fake. And um, so that, and that's not something that we have been seeing in the in the society. So those uh, those are some some of the um, strength that the Japanese society has. Um, also, um, probably I, I should um, point out that, well, for good or bad, um, the Japanese society is relatively closed um, as a democratic um, society. We do not provide, for example, golden visa um, for the you know rich wealthy um, people. Um, to stay in Japan, for example, it's so not so, too easy um, for them to, for example, purchase you know land and, and stuff like that. And so we have um, slightly less openness. But we also, um, of course, have to um, pay attention to the fact that um, those 
actors that are trying to um, spread um, disinformation and uh, will conduct narrative and war campaign are aware of those, um, you know, strength that the Japanese society has. So one of the methods that they are using is to um, spread disinformation or, um, well, manipulated information, not necessarily through SNS, but rather from aggregator sites, for example. Um, in Japan, um, well, a huge number of um, people use um, the Yahoo Japan, for example, as the source of um, news. And so those um, diaspora media that know um, those Japanese consumption tendency try to have news, you know, a news delivery contract with the Yahoo Japan and, and try to spread their, um, you know, news with manipulated information um, through those aggregator sites. It's it's not only um, Yahoo Japan, but um, that has has been the tendency. And also, um, we also have to pay attention to the fact that, um, as Jose Sensei said, the well, advancement of technology is massive. And so um, we have, for example, those um, translation um, AIs like DeepL, which makes it very easy for you know external actors to actually translate from Chinese to Japanese or Russian to Japanese or what have you. And so, um, well, unfortunately, probably um, you know Japanese language would not be um, a barrier kind of you know um, cause anymore. Yes, it's hard to see that lasting much longer. And in a sense, you're talking about this fundamental division and dilemma between openness and being closed, because open societies have uh, a harder time defending themselves against misinformation, but closed societies are vulnerable too. If people think that the media is too collusive and they're not getting the real story, they're gonna look uh, else, elsewhere, right? So it's, it's that, it's that right. balance, right? Yeah. All right. Well, we are out of time. Uh, it's been a very stimulating and very timely discussion. I want to thank my co-host and commentator, Professor Hosoya, as well as our special guest, Professor Ichihara. Thank you very much, and goodbye.